Mr. Leon Pereira. Question, please, sir. So with your leave, can I take the next three questions, eight, nine, and ten together? Yes, please. Uh, at the outset, sir, let me say this. No woman or man should have to suffer the indignity of her or his modesty being insulted or outraged. That's not acceptable. And as a society, we have to make sure that these values are maintained. People's, people must feel safe as they go about their life. Our laws and enforcement must underpin, underpin these values. Uh, the questions by the members relate to the statistics relating to sexual offences in our universities, the way in which police, AGC, exercise their discretion in deciding to prosecute or not prosecute uh, an offender, and the general approach taken by police and AGC in cases relating to sexual misconduct. Uh, let me deal with these two points. Mr. Pereira and Dr. Lee at DBWA have asked about the cases of sexual misconduct in the autonomous universities, or AUs, that were reported to the police. Earlier, MOE Minister has informed Parliament for the academic year 2015 to 2016 to AY 2017-2018, 56 cases of uh, sexual misconduct were reported to the AUs. 37 of these were reported to the police. There was insufficient evidence to make out offences in two cases. Investigations in four other cases are ongoing. Of the remaining 31 cases, 16 were prosecuted in court. There were jail sentences in 10. A supervised probation was imposed by the court in four cases. In one case, the court gave a discharge not amounting to an acquittal and sentencing for one case where the offender has been convicted, the sentencing is still pending. So that leaves a remainder of 15 out of the total of 31 cases. In 13 of these cases, a conditional warning was given. Two others were given a stern warning. 14 of the 15 students who were given warnings 93% did not reoffend. The one NUS student who reoffended had originally had been issued a conditional warning for voyeurism committed in 2015. He reoffended in 2017. Police prosecuted him in court for both the 2015 and the 2017 offenses. He was sent to jail for eight months and fined $2,000. So beyond these 56 cases, there were an additional eight cases reported directly to the police. Of these eight, there was insufficient evidence in six cases, and investigations in another two are ongoing. Police had also earlier clarified some factual inaccuracies in media reporting of cases for academic years 2015 to 2016 and 2017 to 2018. There were 25 cases of sexual offences brought before the NUS board. Of these 25, 17 were reported to the police. Nine of the 17 were prosecuted in court. Courts handed down imprisonment terms in five of those cases, and they gave supervised probation for three cases, and gave discharge not amounting to an acquittal in one case. In another seven of the 17 reported cases, Police administered uh, conditional warnings, and the last case is pending investigations. One of the media articles had also erroneously published that there were 13 repeat offenders. Based on police record records, there was only one repeat offender, and I referred to that case earlier. So these numbers show that some have been prosecuted, depending on the facts. Others have been given a second chance, and there are no free passes to university students or anyone else. But let me give some background to our approach. Uh, I had some time ago asked my ministry, Home Affairs, 
to review sexual offenses, in particular offenses against children. People will remember the Joshua Robinson case. And women, outraging modesty, insulting modesty, other offenses. And I had also given directions to toughen up our laws in these areas. Following the review by PCRC as well as my ministry, we decided that some new offenses should be specified in law and sentences for some existing offenses should be enhanced. We have proposed new offenses to deal with sexual exploitation of minors. We have also proposed new standalone offenses for voyeurism, distribution of uh, intimate images, commonly known as revenge pornography, sexual exposure over the internet, commonly known as uh, cyber flashing. Voyeurism is now dealt with under insulting the modesty of a woman in the penal code. The proposal is to make it a standalone offense and increase the penalties. We have also proposed the updating of some existing offenses to deal with technological developments which enable predatory behavior. This is all set out in the Penal Code uh, Amendments Bill, tabled in Parliament in February. It will be debated later today. If Parliament passes the bill into law, then voyeurism, usually known as peeping tom behavior, as well as the making, possessing, accessing, distributing of voyeuristic material will all be criminalized as specific offenses. It will be presumed that the victim in such recordings did not consent to being recorded. That deals with the evidential challenge sometimes of identifying victims in such recordings. And the penalties will be enhanced. Because of parliamentary rules, I should not go into further detail on the proposed changes. But we will be debating it. And um, of course, these changes were conceptualized, put through, drafted, and tabled in Parliament before the latest discussions on these issues. The proposals show the government's underlying approach and philosophy towards sexual offenses, where the victims are, of course, predominantly women. We take it very seriously. We want to send a very strong signal that will deter would-be offenders and protect victims who, as I said, are predominantly women. Uh, the penal code changes have been thought through for over a year now. All of this, being tough, taking a no-nonsense approach, does not mean that every offender must be or will be automatically charged in court. Police and AGC must look at the facts of each case and exercise discretion. Let me give an example. There was an NUS student. He had taken videos of children in a toilet in a shopping mall happened over two days in 2015. He was caught, arrested by the police. He was charged. After he was charged, police and AGC received a report, a medical report, from his doctor at IMH. The assessment was that his risk of reoffending was low, and he would benefit from continued mental health treatment and if he was put in jail, that could get affected. The fact that he did not have any prior history was also relevant. In the end, AGC directed police to withdraw the charges, and he was given a 24-month conditional warning. He has since completed the 24-month warning period, no further reoffending, and he has uh, remained crime-free. The data I have shown indicates in several other cases, prosec prosecutions were carried out for offenders. We must have tough laws. In fact, we're going to make them even tougher if Parliament agrees. Uh, we are creating new laws as well. But we must also enforce them appropriately. When a woman's privacy has been violated, the follow-up actions must ensure that she is treated with dignity and respect, and her concerns must be addressed, and she must be supported. The criminal legal framework must deal with the offender in a way that ensures the specific 
victim's safety and deal with a specific offender and deter other would-be offenders. In this respect, when such violation takes place in, say, NUS, there are actions that NUS has to take and there are actions that the police have to take. Police will investigate, decide on the best cause of action after investigations, whether to prosecute, not prosecute, and what is the right thing to do on all the factors. Ensure that their decision will protect the victim and uphold deterrence and safety. So Singapore is one of the safest places in the world for women and for children. Our laws and the way we enforce our laws have ensured that. Let me give some brief statistics. Based on police 2018 public perception survey, the perception of overall safety and security in Singapore among locals was 93%. How do women feel? Specifically women and the perceptions of safety in their neighborhoods, 87%, nearly 9 in 10, feel safe in their neighborhoods. 74% of women feel safe walking alone in their neighborhood at night. These figures have been consistently high over the years, and we want to make sure that that continues. Women ought to feel safe. Members can be assured that the government is committed to continue keeping the environment safe and being tough on such offenses. That is why, as I said earlier, we have reviewed the penal code provisions and are proposing new offenses and seeking to enhance penalties. Let me now answer the questions on how police and AGC exercise discretion in such cases. Broadly, the approach is to consider the specific facts and circumstances of the case, the severity of the offense, including the evidence, and aggravating or mitigating factors. Police will also consider how other similar cases have been treated to ensure consistency. In the interest of fairness, like <coughs> cases should be treated like other like cases. The Attorney General, as the public prosecutor, makes the final decision on, based on his prosecutorial discretion. Specific facts, and I say this by way of illustration, could include a previous criminal record, if any, level of remorse, whether the offender comes clean, whether he cooperates, whether any videos of the victim have been posted online or otherwise shared. Police also assess the likelihood of rehabilitation. Police make such assessments regularly when making decisions. It's part of their professional craft. They will then recommend the course of action to prosecute or give a conditional warning or stern warning or to take no further action. AGC will make the final decision. I should add that in these cases, the assessment of future conduct and possible rehab is quite important. This is so even when the offender had done similar acts previously, which will of course weigh against him. Police will look at all the factors, including the level of remorse, whether he owned up voluntarily, likelihood of reform, likelihood of reoffending. They will also, of course, consider the circumstances of the victim, the impact of the offense on the victim, and the need for deterrence. Generally, there would be no reason for police to show any leniency if the following aggravating factors are present. A person has previous convictions or was warned for similar offenses, premeditation and deception in committing the offense, for example, by covering, by using hidden pinhole cameras, masking his face, covering CCTV cameras, or other means to evade detection. Or the video had been shared or circulated, or the perpetrator was not remorseful or has been, had been uncooperative in the investigations. Let me illustrate by reference to a case in 2015. A 23-year-old man filmed a woman showering at Republic Polytechnic. The accused had committed the offenses over a period of four months he tried to evade detection by covering his face with a towel. A covering up CCTVs in the vicinity 
and not own up voluntarily. The man was charged and sentenced for 10 weeks imprisonment. Another illustration, five men were jailed between six months and three years for engaging in serial acts of voyeurism and sharing videos of their victims in an online forum. There have been questions on conditional warning. A conditional warning means offender has been put on notice. He would know that the authorities have enough evidence and are prepared to press charges against him if he does not reform. If he commits a fresh offence during this period, he would be liable to be prosecuted for both the current offence and the subsequent fresh or new offence. In other words, not let off the hook for the earlier offence, he will pay for both. The members have not specifically asked about Mr Lim's case involving Ms Bay. Uh, let me nevertheless point some of the facts out by reference to the broader position I put out. Mr. Lim is on thin ice with this conditional warning. The factors that were taken into account in his case were set out in the police statement. If he offends within the period of 12 months, he will be charged for the offense resulting, relating to Ms. Bay and the new offense. The case has been dealt with, so it is therefore best that I do not go into it in detail on the factors. But briefly, there were factors which could have justified charging him. The primary one, of course, being that he had done something very wrong. These factors were weighed against other factors which would justify giving him another chance. Police weighed both sets of factors and decided that a conditional warning was appropriate. It was one of those cases, uh, quite usual, normal for police, where the decision uh, was based on judgment. Police assessed him to be remorseful and likely to reform. He confessed voluntarily within minutes of the offence being committed and well before any police report was made. He was cooperative with the police. He had not circulated the video. That had been deleted. Other factors have also been mentioned in the police statement. A conditional warning has been an effective deterrent for offenders who have had good propensity to reform even after the stipulated crime free period. And the warning remains an internal record for calibrating future prosecutorial decisions. Perpetrators who receive warnings are told in clear terms if they re-offend they will face serious consequences. And as the cases at the autonomous universities show, most who were given conditional warnings did not re-offend. Out of the 15 who received warnings, one student re-offended and he was dealt with severely. He went to jail. So we take a very stern view of sexual misconduct. S several perpetrators have been prosecuted and put behind bars. But the rigid meeting out of uniform penalties will not serve the wider public interest. Dr. Lee also asked about uh, victim care public education. One area which we continuously review is how to further improve on the support given to victims of sexual crimes who ex experience emotional, psychological damage and stress. Over the years, we have made changes to police processes and the way police officers interact with victims. We have trained a group of specialist investigation officers to handle uh, sexual crime cases. We have rolled out the Once Safe Center where victims of rape can undergo interviews and forensic medical examinations at a single private location without having to go between the police station and the hospital. Uh, we have a response framework to ensure that victims of sexual crimes are attended to quickly and a victim care program that provides emotional support. Dr. Lee asked if we would consider a public education campaign about the harms of taking and uh, distributing voyeuristic videos. 
We certainly will, but I think a very good public education campaign will be if Parliament passes the amendments later today. Uh, that will be given concerted publicity to raise awareness about the new sexual offences, including voyeurism, when it's classified as a, a standalone offence, and uh, enhance penalties. Thank you, sir. Engineer Lee Biwa. Sir, I have three supplementary questions. First, who is the qualified person to make the assessment on the accused suitability for rehab? Is this process applied to all accused persons? And uh, there's strong public outcry. Many feel that MHA gave more consideration for offender than the traumatized victim as future of perpetrator was mentioned, but how about the potential long-term or even possible permanent damage on the victim? So how can MF, MHA ensure that victims are given fair consideration, if not more? And third supplement question, it is not just about Monica Bay and Nicholas Lim. We need to send a strong signal to everyone that we have zero tolerance for sexual harassment. I agree with Minister that we need tougher laws, but I disagree that in sentencing we compare like to like. In fact, the sentencing should be heavier compared to the previous one. So I hope Minister will, will, will consider that. Thank you. Let me try and answer that. Um, <laughs> Who makes the decision on prosecution, I think? Let me see. Oh, assessment for, thank you. Assessment for rehabilitation. I went into the factors in some detail just now. The investigating officers and their superiors make the police assessment and they do this every day. It's not just for uh, victims of sexual offenses, other offenses too. But of course, within the framework of the law, that's why you take into account the severity of the offense, the impact on the victim, the need to deter others. There's a whole set of framework. But within that, you also look at the offender and you make an assessment based on how cooperative he has been. You're sitting down, you're talking to him, you, uh, see uh, whether he confessed or he tried to hide. What does his conduct show about him? Doesn't mean that the assessments will be perfect, but these are highly trained officers who do this every day. They make an assessment. And uh, that is then uh, discussed with the Attorney General's chambers who make the final decision taking into account the legal framework and the overall set of factors. So it's a careful process. I think it is not often that uh, either MHA or the Singapore government is being accused of being soft on these sorts of issues. I think usually the complaint is the reverse, that not enough mercy is shown. And uh, that we have made that an article of faith that we are tough. We are tough on crime. We are tough on the causes of crime. And as the fact that we are putting up uh, amendments to the penal code shows, there was never any intention and never any uh, practice of being soft. I think uh, we err on the side of being tough. At the same time, you look at the facts of each case and uh, where it is possible to exercise discretion, you do it. That it's done by the police as well as by AGC. Now, the second point is the MHA gives consideration to the offenders. Really, more concern and care should be given to the victims. I absolutely agree. The impact on the victims is very important, not just for the victim, but also to deter other conduct, sorry, similar conduct, that, and it will protect others. I think the reason why crime rate in Singapore is so low is because people generally understand a few things. One, if you commit an offence, 
uh, it's likely that you will be caught. Second, if you are caught, there is a very high likelihood that you will be charged, uh, you know, depending on the offense. But, you know, and if you are charged, there is a very high likelihood that you will be found guilty because the investigation would be thorough, the facts will be presented, there is a professional uh, set of lawyers dealing with it, and the courts are staffed by highly trained lawyers. So if the evidence is presented, properly assessed, then it's likely to result in a conviction. But of course, if there is no evidence, or if the evidence is weak, it will be thrown out. And in fact, the AGC would often not even proceed on the basis that there being no adequate evidence. So this framework, I think, is well understood on the ground, which is one of the reasons why I think crime rate is low as well in Singapore. You can't do something and get away with it, by and large. Uh, now, how it is balanced, what were the factors taken into account, I have said in specific cases in my answer, but I agree as a matter of approach and principle, yes, of course, the, what has happened to the victim is uh, extremely important, and nothing I say detracts from that. Third, we have to send a strong signal. What I meant like for like was this. You have a set of facts, a certain decision was taken to prosecute or to give a conditional warning. You then have another case with a similar set of facts. I think fairness requires that in both cases the outcome is similar. So there is consistency. Consistency doesn't mean that leniency. Please don't mistake me. Consistency means you have decided to charge, then you will decide in a subsequent case to charge. If you have decided to give conditional warning and the factors are broadly similar, then you will tend towards giving a conditional warning, but of course you will look at whether there are any other factors. So it's more that there has got to be a certain consistency in the way the law is applied and uh, is processed, not just in the courts. The courts look at precedent for consistency, but also from the perspective of police and agency. That's what I meant. Thank you.